Good evening. Good evening. It's good to be together on this Lord's Day evening. We spent several of us here, the elders, elders and, the, and the deacons, and I spent a lot of time this afternoon uh, going over things, and I'm always encouraged by just seeing all the good work that is happening and um, just really appreciate it. I know that there's a lot of good work happening by everyone, by people all over this group. And I know that there's been a lot of good work on yourselves and into your circle of influence as we have focused this year on sounding forth the word. And so with this lesson tonight, we'll kind of wrap up some of the things that we've been talking about and wrap up this theme and the song we just sang, Ring Out the Message, Ring It Out, comes from, that word ring out is the meaning of this phrase in, in our text for this passage, sounding forth. Another way of translating that is ringing out. Just, it is just like being shouted. It is being declared, the waves of sound going out all over and and Paul said to the Thessalonians, for not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth or rung out from you in Macedonia, which is the northern half of Greece, and in Achaia, the, the southern half of Greece, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. And that's, that's part of our vision. It's just to send the word out, send the word out from us in all different media, send the word out from us in our little circle when we go to school and go to work and do what we do and to do what we can to, to let from our place in our influence, the word of the Lord go forward. And so this sermon's purpose is to conclude this year of work on sounding forth the word and to help us sustain our outreach, just kind of capture what we've been thinking about and, and send it forward with some sense of application. We've had a lot of different evangelism lessons this year, just a few of the series, the Living Water series, where we talked about the role of, of God and of the church and of the listener, the, those who are thirsty. We've talked about how truth is hidden in plain sight. And we had five or six lessons on how we find the truth and how that whole process works and how the Bible explains it and how we go to the missing those who are missing from God's presence, as we might define it from Luke 15. We talked about ready answers. We had a whole evangelism class. And then we've had just a lot of other sermons through the year on this. But at the beginning of the year, we asked this question, what is your next step towards sounding forth the word more effectively? And everybody, a lot of you anyways, wrote down a next step on a piece of paper. I'm wondering how you're feeling about that now, what you wrote down, if you even remember what it was, or as you thought about it, as you thought about where do I need to grow? And not just, this is my dream picture way down the road, but what is the next step close in? What is the one that the poet David White talks about taking the next step close in, the one you don't want to take, <laughs> the one that's right there, and you know what it is, and you're not sure about it. And that's, that's usually a step into a discomfort zone that you know is your next step of growth. How are you doing with that? And I, I know that there has been a lot of growth, and there's a lot of honesty and personal <laughs> reflection at the beginning of the year and as we've gone through, and I've had a lot of conversations. There's been a lot of prayer. There's been a lot of thought. And I remember... Back before kids, I, for a while, did Taekwondo. And I remember the moment walking in with a white belt. And it was like, you know nothing. <laughs> That's what that white melt, <laughs> belt means. And it's, it's um, you know, to, to be a beginner, there's a lot of possibility for growth. But even though you're not a black belt, it's pretty nice to get that yellow belt. It's pretty nice to know that you're progressing. And, and that's something, just as we think about this idea of growing in this, the main thing, the key idea that I hope that we can see is there's so much that you and I and all of us can do to bring the gospel to others. You don't have to be an expert to get involved. 
to get in the game, to find ways. And there are, way, there are so many different ways we've talked about, and we'll talk about some of them again tonight. We talked about a lot of different ways of doing outreach, and, and the key, the fundamental strategy that we have, that we have decided on as we've worked together and thought through things, is to try at this place to make it as simple as possible, to make ways for the congregation to mobilize everybody to be able to get involved. And there's a lot of different ways to do that, right? We, we have gift Bibles, and we have tracts, and we have um, a, a lot of different things we've done. We started this year to put out these short videos, those tall vertical videos, to just give you another way, in addition to the sermons you can share, in addition to all these other things, give you another way of just throwing on social media something that you can share. We've talked about um, trying to constantly have things that are noteworthy and newsworthy for you to invite people to, whether it's a study or an event on you know, an event for ladies or men or something that a family could come to or something about marriage or different, different kinds of events that we can bring people into in addition to really making it easy for you to, to know what's coming up that you can invite people to a regular service or a Bible class. But the two things we want to focus on tonight are where we started, which is prayer, and having targeted prayer about reaching the lost. And then the kind of broader, what we normally think of as evangelism, just engaging with people, which we've spent most of the year, including most of the Bible class we had on it, focused on. How do we engage people in conversation? How do we ask people for a Bible study? How do we deal with the things leading up to that? How do we, how do we ask that hard question of, you know, are you ready? To, to take that next step and to follow Jesus. And so as we focus on these, I want to start by talking a little bit about engaging with people. Engaging with our neighbors. One-on-one. -on -one, you and, or, you know, you and your spouse with someone else and their spouse and having these conversations. And we talked a lot in our Bible class about this metaphor of golf. Remember that? If those of you who are in the Bible class might remember, we talked about how when you play golf, and I am not a golfer, but I have golfed before, and I know that a driver does not do well on the putting green, right? Nor does a putter do well when you're trying to drive the ball. You have a whole bag full of clubs, so many clubs that some people don't even want to carry them, and they hire somebody to follow them around toting this giant bag of clubs, right? There's a lot of different tools that you want to have to move the ball from wherever it is. And so the point we were talking about is you also should have different tools in your, in your arsenal as you're thinking about how to get someone to, to Jesus, to be saved. And so there are those who are very far away. Jesus talks about this in the gospel that you are not far off from the kingdom, or there are those who are, whose hearts were far away from the Lord and from the, from the kingdom. And so there's this sense, maybe it's a metaphor, but this sense of distance and closeness, right? Of, of moving closer to the Lord. And we talked about it, uh, another way that we talked about breaking it down is something called the gray matrix. This guy named Gray came up with many years ago. This says knowledge up here. This says openness. And so we have these different places where you don't just think of it as usually we just think of, do they know the stuff or not? And have they obeyed? But if we think of it from an evangelism standpoint, this is a helpful model to think in terms of four quadrants. How, do they know what they need to know to be saved? And are they open to it? And from this perspective, if you think about our lesson this morning, where was the Ethiopian eunuch? He was in the sweet spot. This is who you want to find. This is so wonderful when you find someone that is super open. They're looking. They want it. But they don't know it yet. 
And so all you have to do is from that passage, Isaiah 53, speak Jesus to them. That's what we, that's, that's what we ideally want. But that doesn't mean that we can't do anything with somebody who's maybe over here, who's not very open to it, but, and who doesn't have the knowledge. We can engage with them in different ways. The, the idea is that some people, and there are people in this room right now who have followed this kind of a path. Some people go from here and go like this. That's, that's the path that we're talking about. Taking people from no knowledge and no openness and moving them closer to openness. And as we go, continuing to create more interest, but also more knowledge. You know, so over here, whenever they're way over here far away, we're engaging with them with questions and with acts of service and with listening and with thinking to, with them. And there's all these different things we're doing to try to just like it's, it's the same skill set as if you were mentoring someone or being a really good friend or being a really good leader. You're engaging with them in a way that creates an openness to growth. And as you serve them, as you say, hey, is there anything I can pray for you about? As you show them who you are, then there's this point where maybe uh, 1 Peter 3.15 comes in that we talked about two weeks ago or three weeks ago. And they ask you about the hope that's within you. And now, maybe they weren't open before, but as Peter keeps talking about throughout the book, they see your holiness. They see how you're responding to things. They see your hope. And they engage differently. So that was a key idea that we talked about. There's another thing that we sometimes think of in terms of a sport that we might, might compare evangelism to. We might think of it as like grappling, you know, like jujitsu. Got a martial arts theme here tonight. But... We propose that whenever somebody comes up to you and is confrontational and is, is bringing some, you know, they're, they're maybe not just over here. Maybe they know some stuff, but they're totally closed off to it. And they're, they, they come ready to do some Brazilian jiu-jitsu with you about it. That we can choose a different martial art like Jesus did and do Aikido instead and use their momentum against them to start to work with them to help them think through their own often conflicted thoughts. Do you remember when Jesus was challenged by the, um, by the Pharisees about um, the baptism? Well, he, he was challenged about where his authority came from. You know, he was challenged about where did, where did he get this authority to make these changes to the temple and that kind of thing. And he asked a question. He said, here's how I'll deal with that. Let me ask you, John the Baptist, where did his authority come from? From heaven or from men? He's parrying with a question. Now, he could have kept engaging with them if they had engaged the question. But they didn't want to play. So they just, he just basically flipped them, <laughs> Aikido style, and they moved on and didn't want to deal with it. And so there wasn't much opportunity because they didn't really want to think with him. They just wanted to run at him. And if you're going to run at us, then, you know, we can just deal with it with some questions. But we might wonder, how do I start a conversation? Well, we can start a conversation with some of those. We listed a lot of different, just to get you started with ideas, a lot of different spiritual conversations. You would be surprised at how much most people actually think about things like purpose, morality, death, what's happening in the world as it relates to the big picture of what is right and what is wrong and where is all this going and what is the right way for a marriage to be sustained and you know, what do you think about Jesus? And what do you think about God? And there's all these kinds of things that if we are ready to actually 
engage a conversation, a two-way conversation, then people will be ready to, in my experience, people are ready to talk. Now, this is, this is back here. This is not, I asked the question and we started talking about what we think life after death is. And then I say, okay, so are you ready to become a Christian, be baptized, uh, wash away your sins? This is somebody who's way back here. We would rather go right into the putting where we're in a Bible study and we're thinking through these things. If they're, back, if they're up here, that's where we want to be. But I'm talking about how do you engage somebody over here? And we can start conversations with people. And the more relationship we have, the more integrity and character they see in us, the more willing they are to see that we might have something to offer in a conversation. And the more we think with them, remember Paul reasoned with people, and that's, that's a, a way of saying he was thinking together with them. Then we can, we can move it forward and, and we can guide the dialogue, continuing to move it towards a particular end. What about those, those people like the Pharisees, maybe somebody who is really engaging with you aggressively? We talked about the Colombo method. What is the Colombo method? Some, you know, I just want you to know I'm too young for Colombo. I'm already, I'm too young. It's not just that Landon's too young for it, but he's awesome. Peter Falk is this really cool, um, in my opinion, detective that he, he has this way in his crumpled, you know, trench coat and his, oh, shucks, I don't know, kind of way about him where he engages with the people he's talking to and disarms them. And then he starts to ask, well, I was just thinking about one more thing as he's talking to the killer. Maybe, maybe this, you know, blood on the sink came from somewhere else. And then all of a sudden you're in a different conversation. So here's three questions. One question. Somebody says to you, you know, all Christians are closed-minded. Or, you know, some bold statement maybe. And you just ask, what do you mean by that? And what you're doing, I'm not saying do it in a confrontational way. Like, what do you mean by that? I'm saying, that's interesting. You know, when you say that, what do you mean? First of all, a lot of people don't even know what they mean. A lot of people haven't ever thought through what they mean by that. It's just something they saw on TikTok, you know, and they're repeating it. But if, as they start thinking through it, you can think through it with them. And, and you're forcing them or you're, you're inviting them to think about, reason about what they actually think makes sense. And so that's the question about learning more. You're trying to get a sense of where they are. You're trying to find out their spiritual address. You're trying to get a sense of how to engage with them. And you're letting them think through where they are. But then we can ask, how did you come to that conclusion? And so now the burden of proof is theirs to provide. They can, they can think through, why do I think that? And they can try to articulate it to you, and you're going to know, do these arguments have any basis or not, and be able to address them, and then maybe start moving them, moving them forward. And then as you listen, it's going to provide an opportunity for you to share some things. You know, it's this only a natural, there's always a natural give and take in conversations, right? Most people are self-aware to realize, I've been talking about what I think for the last 40 minutes and they've just been listening, you know? And that creates an opening. It creates a space. Like the old Stephen Covey principle of highly effective people, seek first to understand and then to be understood. And so you can ask then, well, have you ever considered and propose an alternate way of seeing it? A way that reflects the truth that's in the gospel. Have you ever considered? And, and this is your chance to share a thought. And what we're really trying to do, if we're, if we're way back here in the conversation, is just put a pebble in their shoe. 
right? You ever go hiking? Oh, that's the worst. You're hiking and it's just rubbing you raw and there's a pebble in your shoe. Truth has a way of doing that. The truth has a way of sticking with you. And everywhere you go, you're thinking about that question. Well, where did all of this come from? What is going to happen to me one moment after I die? What, why, what really is the purpose of life if this is all a cosmic accident? All the, whatever. And they're thinking about these things. And then you have the seeds of an opportunity to have the next conversation. And the next conversation, you're creating openness and you're creating opportunity. So it's just a little way of thinking tactically. I mean, these aren't all the answers to all the things, but hopefully it's helpful. Some of this is stuff I've talked about before. Um, some of this is review from this year. But the big point here is you can do this. We can do this. And so many of you are. I know you are. And, um, and, and just remember to keep nudging forward, keep growing. It's, it's an exciting thing to partner, to, to be used by God in this great work. But the other thing that all of us can do is to pray. Pray for workers, pray for boldness, pray for opportunities. The church that prays about these things is the church that has God's power at work in these areas. We, God has in his wisdom chosen to tell his people to pray, to call on him to do things. And he's made it clear, when you do, that changes things. The, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much, you know, James 5. This is where we're going to do some jujitsu, as Paul uses the word in Colossians 4, 12 and 13. He talks about struggling and this word, often translated wrestling, this word is, um, is about going to God in prayer and doing hard. Uh, the, the root word ties to ag agonizing. Not that it means that, but it's, it's the sense of you know, wrestling, struggling, working hard. He says here in verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you always struggling or wrestling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you. And for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis, it's not just working hard as a servant in the field, to bless you, he's doing that. But also, when he goes to be by himself, he is working hard, wrestling in prayer on behalf of the people. And we are, if we are wrestling, not wrestling with God, but grappling with these issues and putting our whole heart into asking God and pleading and trying to see what should I be praying about and seeking it before God, God says, I will answer. It, it will make a difference. Might not always look like what we think it will, but he hears us. And so where do we start? Where can every Christian, what can every Christian do every day that can make all the difference in getting the gospel to the lost? And what Jesus says in Matthew 9, 37, he, whenever he's about to send out his disciples, he starts with prayer. Here in Matthew chapter 9 um, and verse 36, it says, And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The next chapter... This is so interesting. The next chapter is where it notes the 12 apostles and he sends them out. And the whole chapter 10, this is the last verse of chapter 9. All of chapter 10 is Jesus sending out the disciples as workers. You see what happened there? Sometimes you pray for workers and the worker is you. 
That's, and prayer works that way. Prayer shapes us that way too. And we're asking God for other workers too. But the more I pray for workers to come, the more God sends me to the work, strengthens me to the work, gives me wisdom and clarity about the work, blesses me in the work as I go out. You see this same thing happening in Acts chapter 1. They're praying up in the, up in the upper room. And then in Acts chapter 2, all these people are converted. In Acts chapter 4, they're praying for boldness. The thing that they prayed for after they're beaten up, John and Peter, and go back to the rest of the church, they get together. And what they ask for is, May we have boldness in spite of the threats to keep speaking. And then in chapter 8, verse 4, as we talked about this morning, whenever the persecution comes, what did they do? And those who were scattered went about preaching the word. They had the boldness to keep speaking when the, when the trials came. God answered the prayer. They all joined together constantly in prayer. Prayer, may it never be the neglected power in this congregation that, that we have access to. Prayer can be the neglected power that drives church growth, that drives uh, evangelism, that drives the force of the work. And so we need to pray for workers, as Jesus said. We need to pray for boldness, as the early disciples did. We need to pray for open doors as Paul does in Colossians 4, verses 2 to 4, and Acts 14, verse 27, Revelation 3, 8, uh, talks about God will place an open door before you. Pray for opportunity. Pray for boldness. Pray for more workers. And so that's the other part of this equation. Our not-so-secret weapon. When we pray with faith, we succeed. God defines the success. But when we pray with faith, obedient faith, faith that's ready to go where he sends, we succeed. So again, the big idea here as we wrap this, all this up is there's so much you can do to bring the gospel to others. You don't have to be an expert to get involved. And <laughs> Remind you of what Bill Murray says in an old movie called What About Bub? Everything is baby steps. Don't have to do it all overnight. Baby steps to the door. Baby steps to the car. Baby steps. You know what? Baby steps to the next piece, part of growth that's coming for you.